Uh, yeah. So hi everyone. Uh, this is uh, this is let's say a spiritual continuation of a talk I gave some time ago about OpenAI two. Um, and as you'll see, OpenAI two solved most of our problems, but there were some other things which. Uh, uh, actually, the original point of this talk was I was going to give uh, some ideas about how we might fix some of the issues with Procophers, but Christian and I were hacking on this the other day, and we actually figured out that there is a way um, to do this safely. Um, but you'll see what I'm talking about in a second. So um, I'm very happy to take questions and things because I have a feeling I won't make the full half an hour because I'm not going to be doing any proposals here. Um, but yes. So uh, very quickly, the threat model. Um, now, before someone throws something at me, um, I want to point out I did not come up with this. Um, so the basic issue is, is that... Uh, certain container orchestrators that start with a K have this model that basically you can allow users who are not supposed to have privileges to configure the mount table of containers. And the net result is that we have had some very, very painful uh, container breakout attacks or uh, attacks where basically you could end up with a container that has doesn't have SC Linux labels or App Armor labels applied and so on and so on, uh, which all boil down to the fact that uh, when we're executing in run C, we are joining a namespace, and then we then use the procfs in that namespace to then configure the container. We don't bring in a procfs because there were attacks where you could access the procfs and then you could get access to the host. So we use the container one. The problem is, is that if the mount table has been messed with, which should not be possible because that is not something that we allow, but again, certain container runtimes that start with a K do allow it and end with S. Um, so the net result is that we have to figure out a way that we can at least detect that this has happened and that we exit with an error as opposed to not setting app armor labels in your data. Uh, and yes, obviously container runtimes and specifically our container runtime uh, particularly cares about this. Um, but I mean, it's kind of a little bit strange that there is, uh, as you'll see in a second, there was no real way and we've now figured out a way where you can get access to, you can at least be sure that the procfs that you're operating on is the real one and you're not being messed with. So uh, what is special about procfs? Because uh, OpenAT2 should have solved this already. Um, because OpenR2 with resolve flags and all the rest of it uh, means that you won't jump, you can make it so you won't jump into a separate file system, uh, which wasn't possible before, but now with OpenR2, which has been for a couple of years, um, has been possible to do this. Uh, the issue is, is that uh, unlike with, um, sorry, actually the, re the reason you need OpenR2 for this and the reason why you can't just emulate this stuff in user space um, is because Unlike with opening, let's say you do Docker CP or you do something like that where you copy a file into a container and you want to resolve a file in the container file system, uh, okay, if you copy to the wrong file in the container, no one cares. The problem is with proc, proc has several files that are security bits and you need to write to the right one. And the core issue is, and this is, <laughs> when we had a security vulnerability with this, I was, I was very shocked and very, uh, very frustrated, which is that... Um, uh, if you can mess around, so we actually had in Run C a protection against writing to non procfs files for App Armor labels and SC Linux labels. We would check, oh, is slash proc proc, is slash proc uh, self at a current, is that a procfs file? The answer is yes. The problem is, is that proc self shed is a procfs file that you can write anything to and it does literally nothing, but it is a procfs file. So if there is a way to trick you to get to a procfs file, that procfs file, you end up writing nothing and you end up running as an unconfined process, um, which there wasn't attacked like that. Anyway, um, with OpenAI2, we, uh, we actually can solve this for non magic links. So with non magic links, what you would do is that you open slash proc and then you check that its file type is F th with F set of S, you check that its file type is actually procfs, and then you check that the inode number of slash proc is one because it's guaranteed by the ABI that uh, the root of a procfs mount is, has inode number one. And then you can then just use OpenAI2 to, to resolve whatever you want to resolve, and that's all fine if it's not a magic link. Um, Sorry, a magic link, I should explain. A magic link is uh, something like proc self XC or proc self root or proc self CWD or proc self FD, any FD number uh, or proc self NS, any, any namespace. Uh, these are things that look like symlinks and taste like symlinks, uh, but they're not symlinks. They are magic links because they, uh, inside the VFS, they basically will pipe you through to the underlying struct file that that thing was opened or whatever was associated with it, uh, which means that there's no like namespace checks, you're not really resolving it, you're just being f like piped directly to the underlying file, whatever, whatever it happens to be. And that's great if you want to like recover deleted files and stuff, but not so great if you're a container runtime where proc self XC is a binary in the host and then you can overwrite the binary. Anyway, um, so the issue with magic links is that we can't use OpenAT2 uh, trivially because resolve no XDEV, which is this flag that uh, blocks uh, crossing any mount point, um, including bind mounts. And the problem is, is that uh, 
Proxy of XE or Proxy of whatever, if it is a magic link, is almost certainly not going to be a file on Procfs. It's going to be a file somewhere else, which means you're crossing a malboy boundary, which means Resolve Node XE will block you. Uh, and obviously, we can't use Resolve Node Symlinks because that obviously blocks magic links too. Um, so this is where the original version of the slide uh, was going to be about. Hey, here we have. I have five fruity ideas for how we might fix this problem. Uh, but it turns out there is a solution. Uh, and uh, so follow me on this one. Uh, so what you can do is that. So uh, there's this thing called OpenTree, which is part of the new Mount API, which was introduced a couple of years ago. And basically what you can do is that, oh, sorry, uh, this all requires privileges. Uh, you need Capsis admin um, and so on and so on, but uh, okay, whatever, and get there on times we are privileged. It's kind of annoying that you can't do this safely without having privileges, but whatever. Um, you make in a clone. A, in a username space. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah, if you're in a username space, you can do it, uh, assuming you have Capsis admin in that username space. Um, you open tree slash proc, which open tree clone, which what that does is that it's, um, and we'll get to that in a second. This, as an implementation detail, creates an anonymous mount namespace, which then this that thing is then bind mounted into. And then uh, this handle, you can then use as if it's a regular file descriptor to a directory. You then check, as we did last time, you check that it's the right file type, and, uh, the FS type, and that it is the right um, inode. And then you can uh, open the directory of the thing you want to access. Uh, so if you want to access Proxelf XE, you open the PID, your proc self directory or proc PID directory uh, the way you would normally for any other safe thing. And then what you do is then you do statx to check whether or not it's a mount root. Um, and uh, this will then check. Oh, sorry. Uh, I've got to mention uh, the bold thing. Uh, you can mount on top of symlinks. Uh, I don't know how many people know that, but that is a thing that you can do. Um, and so the main issue here is that you can mount on top of symlinks, uh, which is actually, uh, it might be a bug, but um, they wouldn't, uh, I wasn't allowed to remove this feature from the kernel. So we, we have to fix it this way. Um, anyway, so. Because you can mount on top of Proxelf XC with some other file descriptor, um, you uh, have to check whether or not it is a mount root. And if it is not a mount root, then that means nothing is mounted on top of it, and then you can use it. Now, the reason why this is safe and there are no races is because uh, OpenTree clone uh, cannot, the mount tree you get from this cannot be modified at all. Like, at all at all. Um, and there's an example program here. Um, but as I said, it, it, it has, uh, this is like, very undocumented, I mean, the whole mount API is undocumented, but there, this is very highly uh, implementation defined. It just so happens it works that way behavior where it turns out that yes, so an open tree clone- It was planned. <laughs> oh, no, no, so you, okay, the, yeah, the, the, this link here is to a patch he had, which actually fixed the other issue that we would had with this. But the, the thing is, is that, okay, uh, it is, let's not say, I am not sure how guaranteed this is in order for me to depend on this. But basically the issue is, is that, um, so because this thing is an anonymous mount namespace, there is a restriction in Linux that you cannot mount, you cannot do a mount operation onto a mount namespace that you are not a member of, uh, even if you are root, like even if you are Capsis admin on the host, UID zero, the whole shebang, uh, you still cannot mount to it. And uh, that means that you, you, you don't have to worry about someone, again, we're dealing with a situation where a container process can do mount inside a container and then we'd be able to maybe mount to proc self, FD, blah, blah, blah. So uh, basically we can block uh, we don't have to worry about that because that's not allowed. And also mount propagation is not allowed. Yeah. The risk there being that if you were to set proc slash proc as MS shared, uh, and then you would then add a mount to it after this thing, then you would be able to add the race condition. The point is because of these two things and possibly more things that I haven't listed, um, this is currently safe. Yeah. So uh, just to clarify, so OpenTree, what OpenTree clone does, it gives you a, what we would call a detached mount. So similar in the old mount API, what you could have done is you could have mounted, created a bind mount, for example. Okay, you could have created a tempfs file system and mounted it at slash temp. Then you open slash temp to get a file descriptor and then unmounted it unlazily. At this time, the file system isn't anywhere visible in the file system, but you still hold an FD to it. This was usually something that we wanted for safety reasons, but obviously in the old mount API, you had to make this appear within the file system. With OpenTree clone, you can get a detached file descriptor without this mounted first, get a file descriptor unmount dance. It gives you a detached mount. But the, what the kernel internally does, it, it, it takes an anonymous mount namespace, meaning a mount namespace that doesn't really exist. Like you can't access it from user space. You can't see it anywhere. And the consequences of this is um, you can perform operations on this detached mount and it's completely private to you. Like for example, and this is the crucial point, if you have mount propagation set up, mounts won't propagate into the detached mount. So you can be sure that there won't be any overmounts happening while you are operating on this detached mount. And this is a, the, really the guarantee that we need when we want to have something like a safe exec. Yeah. 
And I mean, the, the other thing is that we have um, is that uh, with with the old mount API, you couldn't you um, you can't mount to a file descriptor the old one, and so you would have to. Actually, I figured out this. You can actually, if you chdir into the thing into Brockfs, then I think maybe it might be safe. Question mark. I'm not entirely sure, um, but I, that's a thing for libpath for us to deal with in a second. Um, but yeah, so that was basically here is where I would have discussed. Um, uh, several other things. I mean, there are other things which I haven't put in this in this talk because um, I'm not entirely sure how how useful it would be. But one of the things is that we want to have o uh, OMT path for open, so you could do a file script to reopen without going through BockFS entirely, um, which would be nice. But the fact that we can do this this bit safely means that that whole thing is a separate topic. And actually, there are semantic questions that we need to sort out with that that um, could be like a three hour talk on their own. Um, but basically, the the short version is is that at the moment this is safe, I believe. Um, but I would like uh, someone either now or later to tell me that I can depend on this, as opposed to me depending on this, and it turns out, oh, no, oops, we actually disabled this thing uh, in if Linux. We, what do you mean explicitly? Like, we can't change this, this is you API. Uh, right, you can't change the way it functions, but you can change, I don't know, uh, you could, well, someone could decide to remove this, that it's a different mount namespace check. Someone, it, it could be made that this is somehow associated with the actual mount namespace the, the no. thing is in. It could be, I mean, yeah, they they could technically, but we we rely on this. Uh, I'm sorry, we rely on this in various places already in Lexi and uh, and Lexi. But do you for, specifically for, rely on that no one can mount into it? Is that something you specifically rely on? Huh, or sorry? It, do you specifically rely on the fact that you that uh, that it's an mount into bar space, will always yeah. fail no matter who tries? For example, it, I don't. I wouldn't mind if they decide to attach an actual mount namespace on it. But what I consider UAPI, like Hart said, UAPI is that you don't receive mount propagation. If suddenly we were to receive right. mount propagation, that basically they, the kernel would backdoor us. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We definitely don't need mount propagation. Yeah, mount propagation is yeah. We need both to not be the case. Yeah. Um, I mean, I have faith that this would not change. It's just a. Uh, I feel like I need something a little bit stronger. You've just gotten paranoid over the years. I've gotten very paranoid. Yes. This. I. Yeah, when I discovered that you can mount double symlinks, I. I. Yeah. I. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, I was checking out of my bed for, for, for things for like a month. Uh, anyway, um, so yeah, I'm gonna, yeah, so I will talk uh, about libpartheras. Uh, uh, so yeah, libpartheras is something which I introduced uh, um, in 2019 at a plumber's talk. This is the slide when I introduced it in, in 2019. Um, as a quick recap, so OpenAct 2, which allows you to do safe path resolution, just allows you to open files. It doesn't allow you to do anything else. And uh, this is a good enough primitive for you to be able to do basically everything. The problem is, is that in order to use this properly is quite complicated. I mean, uh, using it even if you trust slash /proc is kind of complicated. But if you don't trust slash /proc, then you have to do this whole open tree business uh, in your process, and then you need to know how to correctly handle this in order to do a reopen properly. Um, and then, uh, and then you also have to deal with the fact that like some syscalls don't take file descriptors. So you have to go through slash /proc, uh, and actually one of the issues, which I will talk about in a second, is that um, if a if a um, syscall does not take a file descriptor, um, the traditional way traditional way the way that we would get around that is that you would use slash /proc slash /blah blah blah. blah. Uh, the problem is that if we don't trust slash /proc, uh, that doesn't work. Uh, I actually I actually have figured out that if you ch if you ch uh, chdir into the parent. And it is this open tree parent of proc, and then you do a, lo a mount to the like relative path. Then there should be no way to screw with you. The problem is, is that libpathrest is a library, so we would then have to we would have to spawn a thread to do this um, every single time, mm. uh, and it would be awful. But uh, at least for uh, yeah, at least for old corners, it's not a problem. Sorry, are you urine? Yes. Um, oh, wait, are you urine? Doesn't have does the urine have a mount op? Uh, Not yet. I don't think yet, but it will. <laughs> we can add it. Uh, but yeah. Um, anyway, the point is, is that, yeah, so th this using this correctly is very, very complicated. And uh, again, the, the open at 2 stuff was added purely because we had no way of protecting against mount point crossings at all. Because um, the traditional way of the traditional way of protecting against mount point crossings um, is that you would check, you know, whether or not it's the same device number and whether it's the same. Uh, Whatever you do, like the statics check of the parent and the child, and you would see whether or not they're the same device or not. And the problem is that that doesn't work for bind mounts. And of, and obviously our main issue, at least with Procovis, but also with many other things, is that well, I mean you can create bind mounts that are very dodgy. You can so on and so on. So um, 
open pantry solved that problem, but the question of how would we uh, how would you actually use it as a separate topic. So libpathrest is a Rust library that I uh, have been writing, um, which basically provides a uh, a safe VFS API, which would allow you to do these resolutions safely, and then you would also have uh, backward compatibility support where you can run on. I mean, at this point, this made even more sense in 2019 or 2020, but um, the it would also allow you to uh, run on older kernels where it would do the old fashioned way of doing these checks. Obviously there are certain checks you can't do on old kernels like the mount point stuff, but you would be able to at least avoid crossing symlink boundaries and so on and so on. And that's basically the best thing that container runtimes and everyone else and systemd and whatever else was doing before open at two. So at least you would get that for free effectively for old kernels. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, at the moment, what is going on with this? So with libpathrs, um, the safe wrappers for Procofest stuff is something that I wanted to add. Um, and now that we have a way to get safe wrappers uh, this way, which hopefully will not be broken at some point, um, you can basically, we would have in, in the library, you would have a cache to Procofest handle that would be opened and open. Again, this requires privileges. So for unprivileged users, you would not be able to do any of this. You would have to just trust the Procofest's thing, but I guess, most of the times we need to be sure the Procofest is what we want. In most cases, we're running privileged because uh, in most cases, that's what matters. Um, and ultimately, you only need the open tree stuff for magic links. For regular files, you can just use OpenR2. So uh, it is just for magic links that we have to deal with this problem. Um, so it's not that bad. But basically, you would have like uh, this cached uh, FD, which you probably could get a, a hold of if you wanted to do your own stuff on it. And then you would have like proc self get or something XE, which would then give you a handle to proxy of XE after checking that it actually is the real thing. And then you can then do whatever you like with that, um, like exec it effectively. So because in, in run C, we, we do exec the proxy of XE several times. And actually LXC does now because we, because uh, of the security patch we added for uh, for the other CV. Um, anyway, so that's that. Uh, there are some other issues like uh, having a sane C API, um, which is, uh, so there is a there is an issue, which is that we we will need to run this from Go um we need to use this from go and uh go programmers are used to the fact that you can close file handles more than once and nothing happens um and so in go the way that they do this is they have this like atomic bit magic stuff where they basically are implementing a mutex but it's meant to be faster and this is done in order for you to be able to do this close thing and the after the after the first close it's all no up uh the thing is that there's no way to re-implement this in go nicely you have to basically copy paste the code from the standard library and then modify it to not use the internal uh runtime mutexes or runtime semaphores that the thing has internally and yada yada. Um, and so on, I did that. Um, but basically the issue is, is that uh, all the live list checks and all the rest of it, whether or not you have to freeze stuff, um, I, wanted to, I wanted to try to make it as footcom proof as possible. But as far as I can tell, once you cross like three language barriers for one call, it's basically impossible to do that nicely. Um, so at this point, I'm just wondering whether I should just make everything return an FD and then people can either footcom themselves or not. I don't know what people's opinions on that are. I mean, you know, I mean, at the moment, the way it works is that you get back a, uh, you get back a uh, a number, which is a pointer, uh, but it is not actually dereferenced because in order to make sure that you don't double free, we have a global hash map. I, this is all going to be. Uh, I apologize in advance. Um, which basically, the pointer is actually used as a key in this hash map, so that when you if you double free, nothing bad happens. Um, now, why did I do it this way? Uh, Basically, the issue was that, yeah, in Go, we wanted to make sure that this thing was safe in Go. And if I have to make it safe in Go, I might as well make it safe everywhere. Uh, I later discovered that actually I have to do it in Go twice, but that's a different topic. Um, basically, yeah, but if we just return file descriptors, then there's no liveliness problems of having open, having to allocate something and then leak it to the C code, which then has to go as to pick up and yada, yada. Um, if anyone has an opinion about that, I would love to hear it. If just FDs are fine and everyone will, will survive. I don't know, because the issue is that um, for the like the root file script and stuff like that, you would you would have to make sure you never use anything other than the libpathrs calls for it, mm. because otherwise you you would just be doing an unsafe operation. But by hiding it behind a pointer, which is not actually a pointer, uh, then you uh, then you can't. You have to. I mean, you can leak it obviously, but you but like you would be stopped from like having a brain fart and then, like you're like, oh, I got this file descriptor. Let me open this thing or let me mount this thing. So the the goal of the para Pathrest, as far as I understood, is like, for example, a lot of the, the low level user space programs that write or that exist that do a manual symlink chasing and uh, path resolution, right? Yeah. And it's pretty 
difficult to get this right. So this yeah. would all be encapsulated, or is all encapsulated? It is. Sorry. I, um, yeah. It's um. It it, 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 yeah. it supports all the kernels. Yeah. So like it it re basically emulates. It does that symlink chasing and all the rest of that in all of the kernels. Yeah. So that's that's all done. The question is whether or not like actually using it. Should I just give you a file descriptor back that is like, oh, this is the thing that you want, or should I do this whole awful uh, uh, thing? I, I I did not I did not anticipate how painful it would be to write Go APIs. That yeah. I feel um, I. Just from ease of programming, but this is really just my. No one, no I one would, cares. I would like a file descriptor. Okay, even, even even though if you actually used it, you would you would break things. I mean, you probably wouldn't, but some people would. Okay. Yeah. Oh, whatever. Fine. Um, I mean, whatever. It's a C library, so foot guns are, are actually yeah. a welcome. Um, uh, yeah, and then there's the multi guy stuff. So basically, uh, at the moment, uh, libpathrs could actually be used. So there is a program I wrote called Imochi, which is um a container image tool, and it internally has to do this all this symlink stuff. And uh, but it doesn't do anything too complicated. It's not it's not a container runtime. It is just purely like um, uh, not to denigrate my own work too much. It is basically a glorified tar. And so um, we have to uh, we do have to do a lot of operations on things and so on and so on. And so um, this will be the obvious first program to port. Um, and libpathrs currently is is at a point where you could port it um, pretty much. But um, there are stuff for the for Run C and for LXC and everyone else. Uh, the main one is the mount API. I'm not really sure what to do here because um, uh, internally we would use the new mount API for for uh, anything because again the issue is, is that uh, the old mount API you can't give it a file descriptor, so you have to go through proc and the chdir trick aside, um, which I would have to think about how safe that actually is. I mean, I guess if you chdir into the open tree thing, then it would be safe because who's going to change anything from underneath you, right? I guess that would be safe. It's awful, but it would be safe. Anyway, um, uh, so yeah, but we would use that as a fallback. But the point is, is that um, I was wondering, should I try to uh, have like a mount API abstraction that everyone can use, or should I just have the mount syscall, like libpathrs underscore mount, that takes the mount syscall arguments, and internally it fucks with everything. I feel like I'm not that familiar with how many, um, probably other people are, with how many libraries actually exist that, for example, just do the symlink chasing for you and then safely opening the final um, the final file descriptor. I think even if you just put out a version of libpathrs that implements these basic semantics that people can link against, that would already be quite a win in my opinion. My point being, instead of waiting until you've duplicated most of the uh, VFS API and then releasing something. I want to avoid doing that. That is not, that is not my intention. The yeah. problem is, is that there is, so the issue is that if we do, if we just have the chasing thing, then that is, uh, that is basically lib open at two is what that becomes because at that point you still have to deal with um, the Procofs crap and then you have still have to deal with the the um, this thing where uh, like yeah mount like if you, if you mount you have to know that you have to open tree and then you have to chdr into an open tree and then do a mount of like mount one comma two <laughs> like, like that's that's what mm -hmm. you have to do basically um, and yeah I mean like that I think should work um, but uh, Oh, and then we'd have to write, and then if you have oh, an overlay FS, we would have to we have to rewrite the. I would just like the, to uh, to start relying on this. To be honest, that's that's okay. the thing. I want some yeah. some of the uh, code that we have that does the symlink chasing stuff, which I've I no okay. idea if this is per perfectly fine. What we do, I hope it is. It has held up for quite a few years, but ideally, if we could just like you know, conditionally compile this code and then use this, yeah. Uh, would be way so just better. so just first first right first version. I mean, have... the, the, there is a the, the issue will be oh you expose a C API right yeah yeah okay the, the, the yeah. problem always is uh, building Rust and C together right but it would be yep. Uh, yep. I mean like this would yep. be packaged by distributions yep. and it, and it would indeed be conditional on our side because we I suspect we still have some weird architectures where Rust is not much of a thing yet. Um, I mean, what mostly because, like, for, for LXD, that'd be fine. For LibLXC, we still got people running it on, like, some very weird old flavors of MIPS and yeah. shit, which is probably not ideal. So I don't think we would be able to just mandate its use. But, yeah, we, but could, we could make it conditional and use it if, if it's yeah. available. But do you think even the Fiverr versions are still used on crappy, uh, sorry, not crappy, on uh, <laughs> very strange architectures? Um, IA64? Well, IA64, I hope not, because there should only be like a dozen machines left on this planet at this point, so probably not. Um, yeah. Like, But 
or I don't know, also don't think like we care about like M68K or that kind of crap, but we we probably do care about like whatever weird version of MIPS is running on like an old Linksys Linksys router because OpenWRT is shipping currently by Lexi. It just bothers me that it seems user space is duplicating all of this symlink chasing stuff, which is like a giant. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. That I want, I want that to not be the case anymore. Okay. Um, to be honest, I think the issue is actually that a lot of user space does not deal with this because they are not aware that it is a problem or whatever. And so, like, Open Two is meant to solve this, but um, oops, yeah. yeah. But the issue is that right. So, um, yeah, I I don't want to re I don't want to reinvent the entire VFS API. The key thing is is that any any syscall that does not have uh, that takes a file descriptor is user uh, the lib the library user can just use it the way we they would normally use it. Um, any syscall that takes a path and there is no other way of getting around it, um, if I give it to them, it's a footgun because if they, uh, first of all, uh, if they would know how to use it for, for certain things, I mean, I guess they would be relatively clever. So they would know that they can do it through proc. But the thing is, if you do, do it through slash proc, then it's not safe, at least in our particular use case. And it's a case of like, well, if we already have a library that is going to have to do this procfs stuff, we might as well have it so that everything is just is just sure. safe. And we don't have to worry about it. Um, but yeah, I mean, again, I know that in LXC, you guys don't um, don't have to deal with this problem because you have a cached version of the proc thing that you have, you, can, you know is safe. Yada yada. It would be lovely if we had that. We don't have that. Um, but uh, yeah. Anyway, um, but yeah, I mean, look, if the end of this conversation is that I'm going to reimplement this entire thing in C, uh, no, I don't. I don't yeah. think there is a reason for that. I mean, I reimplemented it once. It was originally in Go, so I mean, <laughs> third time's the charm, right? Um, yeah. I think Rust was a pretty good choice for this. But anyway, so yeah, I think um, yeah, my uh, my thoughts on this have changed a little bit in the past, like let's say a couple months, where I I now think that um, I never want to reimplement the whole thing, but I think that if we just give file descriptors, especially to C, if we just give file descriptors and um, we have a handful of operations, um, yeah, I but I think that we I think we would need the mount stuff. Mm -hmm. I think we would need mount, and I think we need um, we need rename, and we need. Um, we need a way to unmount by file descriptor, probably. Ah, but you can do the chdr thing. Oh, that's going to be yeah. No, we need we own that. We need u mount at. No, 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 sorry, sorry. We need u mount at. Definitely u mount at. But um, oh right, yeah. You don't want me to spawn a thread, right? Okay. No, I'm thinking. Um... If you spawn a thread, because so the chdr thing is that if you um if you spawn a thread and then you change its directory into so okay uh let's say the you have a handle to. Which you know is that mount point, which is FD5. You chdir into proxelf FD, and then you u mount brackets uh, quotes five. Yeah, yeah. In open tree. I know. Yeah, yeah. That's what you do right now. Uh, that is what, what the partners will do. Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, yes. Well, that's what we will have to do. Um, but I agree, we need a u mount that. I mean, this is yeah, kind of ridiculous. Um, yeah, that's anyway. That's that's basically it. I mean, has any questions or or anything at me? A clarification uh, for my benefit, because I couldn't quite understand on the problem statement. Um, the world song and dance with the open tree. We need to do that anytime we have uh, a mount being done from outside into. A namespace, or only when the container manager or namespace manager is itself using proc self something to avoid the problem that we were talking about. Uh, the, the, the second, the second one. So, so in run C, when you join it, because uh, joining a container is not atomic, we have to we join the container, and then we have to do stuff in slash proc. In particular, there are there are things which are completely impossible to do from a separate process, such as uh, it is impossible to set someone else's app armor label, and so you have to be the process itself to set the app armor label, which means that the process which is like I don't know the zygote or whatever you would call it. The, the 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 process that will eventually become the in it in the container has to set its own app on it label. And at that point, we are currently doing this through the proc in the container. We used to have a proc handle from the host, but this was used to attack the host because if you have a handle to slash procfs from the host, uh, and you the container gets access to it, you can just go straight to the root file system of the host. Now this is in theory fixed uh, through. Uh, setting is not dumpable and yada yada, but um, and a bunch of other fixes. But I I have I have concerns that I don't even want to have anything from the host in the container, even if theoretically it's safe. I I just don't like the idea. Um, so so uh, for example, um, we were joking about this uh, yesterday, but with the uh, IOURing clone and exec command, 
currently when we uh, attach or fork a new process into a container, we have to recreate the world, double fork to make sure that we uh, are uh, you know the correct child, uh, the correct parent, have the correct parent in the container that we're executing in. And that there is so much stuff that can go wrong in between, um, and in including the proc stuff, because we can't rely on any information that uh, is inside uh, that is from inside of the container. The proc inside of the container must be untrusted. I know system B is a different model because you talk to system B inside of the container, but for most container runtimes, the model is the workload that is running can't be trusted. So we're, we're not touching proc, we're not uh, touching sys. So we always, so for, for Lexi, we always rely on the proc of the, that um, the uh, container manager, which hangs around for us, uh, stashes when it uh, boots up. We have a separate handle. We basically have like a detached mount that we created when we started up the container. So that's what we operate on if we have to, but we don't touch uh, the proc of the uh, work payload. And um, basically what I'm saying, if we would have something like fork into container, which would require that we have a container concept in the kernel, that would be way nicer, it would be way easier. It would, yeah. you know, it would make this all go away because we also have to recreate C groups it's made a bit easier because we have clone into C group now. Yeah, yeah, and the thing is, is that we have um, uh, what was I gonna say? Uh, yeah, I agree. I mean, it's, yeah, and, it, and it's not helping that the you know the the LSM API is like a random obscure file in Prague because like for for C groups we do have the clone into C group, but we can effectively pass what the C group FD or something. Um, but there's no real equivalent for the LSM. Like we can't be like clone and that's the LSM config I'd like, please. Um, would be convenient if you could like pass in, you know, seccamp and uh, apamo and Linux, all that stuff through a clone, but that's a bit more obscure. Um, right. There is one thing that we do in system D, which doesn't go to the PID one in, inside, which is we allow doing bind mounts on a live, system service that uses user namespaces and mountain spaces. And I, I need to check, we might use change in there in the namespace and then do proc self FD something. Is that something I should check and be worried about? Uh, if you're joining a container, if you're joining a namespace that is a container, uh, okay. So the thing is, it depends entirely on the threat model. If the threat model for system DN spawn is that like, uh, workloads in the container will not have capsis admin and we can trust PID1, then, uh, I would so, I would like for there to be <laughs> for more checks done, but I suspect that, that there isn't an attack you can do, assuming that the threat model for system DN spawn is basically that uh, this thing when I started at the start, that like that you're not Kubernetes. I mean, sorry, container runtime starts with a K. If you're not Kubernetes and you don't have this thing where you allow unprivileged users to specify just random mounts and stuff like that, if that is not possible, then you in theory would not have to worry about this. Even though I would say it's probably a good idea to. Do something. It's not just end spawn, it's also for system services. We run those in namespaces and mm -hmm. allow bind mounts inside of those with user and mount namespaces. So it's not just end spawn. So this is, a, this is a, we do this uh, differently. We have like a shared mount point. We, I always call it a tunnel between namespaces. And we, no, okay, Leonard stole this from us basically. Yeah. I just stole it, but I mean, we're friends, so it's fine. <laughs> I mean, uh, but yeah, and then they propagate into the mount point and then you mount move it and then you unmount yep. uh, yes. uh, on the host. Yeah. But there might be yeah. some proc self FD to get the mounts yeah. when we're inside. So, so that's what I was worried I, about. I talked about this. You have, I think you have a very different model in n spawn because you, you, you always assume that system D is also running in inside N-spawn, yes. The world. N -spawn, so yes. I, for example, where we go through all of the dance, forking into the container and so on, then exiting a shell, then doing, you know, FD redirection to be able to type on the TTA yeah, and yeah. so on. They just talk to system D inside of the container workload and say, give me a, basically give me a shell. Right, okay, yeah. yeah. But again, but that's for, for, which we for end spawn, um, not for system. So by, by the way, uh, we are slightly over, we're at 11.34. Oh, the next talk is at 11.45. It is break now, so that's why I didn't cut everyone off immediately, but it is break time. We're starting back in about 10 minutes. So feel free to keep having the discussion, it's fine, but. I'll come down.